Welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement Podcast with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I thought I'd be healthier, in better shape, feel better both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and be further along in my life? If so, come on this journey with my dad as he explores all things health and wellness from a holistic, medical perspective, even as a classically trained physician. He'll share integrative strategies to optimize health and inspire you to join the modern medicine movement. Welcome, 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 welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement Podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here and a big aloha. Oh, happy, happy Sunday, guys. It's a beautiful day. I'm recording live. It's a beautiful outside. Oh my gosh, we are so blessed. It's a bluebird day, beautiful blue skies, a little teeny pinch of vitamin D on offer still outside. And <laughs> oh, I'm just feeling grateful, feeling grateful for you, feeling grateful for life, feeling grateful for family, feeling grateful for this opportunity to share with you guys. Got a super, super exciting episode today. Oh, it's you guys are going to love it. You guys are going to love it. You're going to get smarter. <laughs> uh, it's a super fun episode coming up. But first, just wanted to just shout out to all you listeners out there. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for dropping a review on Apple Podcasts. If you haven't done so, please, please, please do that. I so appreciate when you guys do that. Oh, just gets me pumped up. Just gets me just... Just really, really grateful for you, for my listeners, just to see that this podcast is helping you, that it's meaningful, applicable, that you're using it in your lives. And so thank you for doing that. If you haven't, jump on over there to Apple Podcast of the Modern Medicine Movement and scroll down to where you see those five stars. Click on the one farthest to the right or five stars and then click on the little box on the left, just right under that with the little pencil sticking up to the right corner and click on that to write a review. And just give me a quick shout out. Let me know what you're loving. Let me know what you've learned. Let me know, you know, just how you're feeling about this podcast. I so appreciate you guys. And also, if you haven't already, join my free Facebook group, the Modern Medicine Movement Health and Wellness Facebook group. I'm going live there about once a week, sometimes more than that, posting up videos, posting up my podcast, posting up other pearls. Um, we're just getting we're just getting started over there. Now we got a few hundred of you folks subscribed. It's pretty fun to to see the interaction, to share with you guys. So go ahead and subscribe. It's free. And uh, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be getting just better and better with every week. So super pumped to share with you guys there as well. You'll be the first to know about new podcast releases, which tend to be at the beginning of the week, usually on either Monday or Tuesday. This one I'm recording on Sunday because I have the time, and it's just so beautiful outside. I'm sitting here in my. <laughs> I'll just call it my home office, but in the bedroom here, looking out the window, and um, oh, just looking outside gets me pumped, just makes me want to share with you guys, and uh, today's podcast is no exception. I think you'll all enjoy it. You'll learn a bunch of cool stuff, and you'll get smarter, and you'll remember more because of it, because today, we're going to be talking all about memory, how to improve your memory and how to improve your brain health, get smarter, remember things longer, flex that mental muscle that we got because we all know that, you know, the brain is a proverbial muscle, right? <laughs> you got to use it. You don't want to lose it. So you got to use it and exercise it and pump it up like our good buddies from SNL years ago, Hans and Franz. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty fun podcast, guys. I, I got to tell you, man, I my 47th year of life, and uh, <laughs> I occasionally have a little senior moment where I just can't remember where I put the keys, or I can't remember where I put my silly cell phone, or I can't remember, you know, just kind of silly stuff, you know? I'll come in from, uh, you know, my $800 Costco run because I got six kids, and I'll have all this food, and 
you know, I will have misplaced something and all that mess. And, you know, I'll find it a week later under the seat or something. <laughs> Thank goodness right now where I am, stuff doesn't really go bad if you leave it in the car, unless unless it can't be frozen. <laughs> because if you leave it overnight, it's going to be frozen in the morning. <laughs> so it's just kind of funny. I, <laughs> I'm a young guy and, you know, I forget things from time to time. And so I wanted to podcast on how we can improve our mental muscles, improve our memory. (laughs) You know how that saying goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, that's crap. (laughs) You can. You can definitely teach an old dog new tricks. And in fact, the reason we can is because of what's called neuroplasticity, which is the fact that our brains can, even in older age, even much beyond my age, right? I'm coming up on 50, but even in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, we can establish new neuronal pathways if we flex that brain muscle that we've got (laughs) and utilize what's called neuroplasticity in our favor. That's basically just growing new pathways in our brain, and, you know, changing existing connections, adapting and, you know, solidifying these new things that we're learning. You know, one of the um, most recent examples of this for me is that I think some of you may know, I just tried really for the first time in my life, it's hard to believe really, but I tried downhill, you know, resort, lift, you know, access skiing. Before I had done a little bit of, you know, that, you uh, cross-country skiing where it's more like for exercise, but I didn't really have the uh, (laughs) downhill skiing uh, skills. Um, And I I wanted to learn because all of my kids started skiing. I just really felt like they should all have a basis in skiing before they hopped on the, you know, snowboarding bandwagon that I hopped on 37 years ago. (laughs) And when I did, it was kind of to the, (laughs) you know, um, it, it didn't help my skiing, let's just say that. <laughs> Once I hopped on a snowboard, being a kid that grew up surfing, skateboarding, like, I was done. <laughs> That's all I wanted to do, but I've always wanted to really learn how to ski. And so about two weeks ago, for the first time, literally legit, I rode up a lift with skis on. I'd never practiced downhill skiing, never took a lesson, nothing. (laughs) Thankfully, I had four boys with me who all ski (laughs) and they gave me some pointers on my first run down the hill because I didn't do the bunny hill. Like I legit went to the top of the lift (laughs) on the main mountain and we just went for it. (laughs) We just went for it. Thankfully, you know, early season conditions exist and everything's pretty much groomer stuff. So I wasn't doing tree runs or anything, but... (laughs) But I got on out there and my boys gave me some tips and and guess what? Within a couple of days, like I was pretty much cruising. You know, I, I, I legit like can go pretty dang fast down the mountain. I can do pretty good edge turns. I'm I never even did learn the pizza. Like, what's that? Like the snowplow? I didn't I didn't learn that. That wasn't part of my vocabulary. My boys made it <laughs> a point to not teach me how to do the proverbial snowplow or the pizza because they're like, why would you ever do that, man? Just do a quick, sharp edge turn if you want to, you know, slow down or stop. Like, don't ever do that silly snowplow thing. You look like a goof and you don't need it. So they didn't teach me that thing. And (laughs) I'm grateful. And I am (laughs) living proof that the old dog can learn new tricks and you can learn new tricks well into your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, because your brain It wants to do stuff. It wants to learn, but you got to give it a chance. You got to let it. You got to flex that muscle and give your brain a proverbial workout, right? (laughs) One of my favorite uh, sort of brain health uh, experts is Dr. Daniel Amen. I've quoted him in some previous podcasts, and he wrote a couple of books on this kind of thing. Um, And uh, I think one of them was called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. I read that a few years back and I loved it. It it really had lots of good pearls in there. You know, he speaks in a way that's easy to understand. And, you know, some of the things he would always mention with exercising your brain, if you will, is it's, uh, you just got to keep it active, you know, be it, uh, doing, um, what I sometimes call mental gymnastics, you know, like crossword puzzles or things like that, but you got to actually 
give it some other kind of motion coordination kind of muscle type exercise with the brain. Like he always talks about racket sports, you know, doing things like table tennis or ping pong or regular tennis or um, nowadays it's becoming more and more popular. This sport kind of a hybrid between uh, tennis and table tennis or ping pong is like pickleball, right? It's a smaller court. It's a slower moving ball, but it's, it's pretty dang, it's pretty dang fun. My kids and I set up a court and we just started playing over the past year. And, um, I hope one day we'll have a legit regulation, uh, table tennis, um, because I loved, loved, loved that growing up. And I want to show my boys that I can school them at something because <laughs> they can school me at a lot of things, including downhill skiing, but I'm catching up. <laughs> so coordination type exercises are really, really good for the brain. And really anything, like if you want to really flex that brain muscle, so to speak, just try learning something new. I mean, legit, like if you want to play an instrument, like go ahead and start learning it. Like for me, for example, in my 40s, I started playing the guitar. I've always wanted to play the guitar, and I'm not awesome at it, but I'm, I'm learning, and it's, and it's awesome, and it's fun, and you know, I got one of my kids to learn with me, and the only downside right now is he's so into the piano that <laughs> he doesn't really want to play guitar anymore with me, so I just, uh, you know, I got to play alone, which kind of bums me out, but uh, hopefully he'll pick it back up at some point, but, but choose something where you can use your mind, you can use your fingers, you know, you can really um, develop a new skill, you know, a new hobby, a new pastime, something that'll um, force you to, to learn something different, a little bit new, a little different activity. Like I said, a racket sport. Um, or like me, I just tried skiing for the first time, and it's pretty dang fun. Really, anything you do that's unfamiliar and a little bit out of your comfort zone, like that's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. That's where you'll get sort of that brain boosting exercise, that neuroplasticity. You, you know, if you're just doing something you've always done, like for me, it was snowboarding. I could pretty much go down the snowboarding hill blindfolded, you know, if there weren't uh, rocks and trees in the way, things like that. I mean, it would be pretty much effortless, not really a challenge, but going out with two sets of, you know, <laughs> devices, one on each foot, you know, having to lean differently and use those two things and not the one, you know, that I was used to, <laughs> it required a whole different muscle memory. And, and so that was kind of a good, a good uh, task for me to, uh, not only challenge myself, but challenge my brain. It was pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> and if it's, you know, if it's something you want to do that you're already doing, well, you got to, you know, for example, let's say you play the piano really well. Well, if you really want it to be brain boosting, so to speak, you just can't play those couple of pieces that you play beautifully and perfectly and you got memorized that, I mean, you can kind of do that on autopilot as well. Like I was with my snowboard. You got to challenge yourself. Like my one kid, he he just got this uh, thing on the computer where he can make his own music um, and he can download other people's music. He can write his own music. It's amazing. And he, he put on here that he's a professional <laughs> and he's pretty dang good. I have to admit, like I've played the piano my whole life and he's way better than I am. And um, he, he chose the professional level because, you know, like for him, a four finger chord is like no big deal. Like for me, once I get three fingers, if I got to do a fourth finger on that chord, like I got to like look at my hand and make sure I'm hitting the right key. <laughs> but he literally wrote a song just this past week on his own with the entire thing being largely four finger chords because he wants to challenge himself. <laughs> Maybe I'll share that song with you on social media here um, once I can get him to play it. But he's got it all written out. He's got, you know, he, he totally legit wrote it himself, which is pretty, pretty cool. So we got to challenge ourselves. So if we do something well already, we got to, we got to, you know, take it to the next level, so to speak, you know, um, whether that's with music or with a sport or with some skill that we do, you know, juggling or some language that we speak, you know, we got to take it to the next level a little bit. We got to really, um, sort of flex a little bit, you know, and, uh, we gotta, we, we can't just do the rote stuff that we already do really well. We got to challenge our minds. So that's kind of a fun way to get started. There's a lot of cool stuff we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to just change topics completely and tell you about a cool study that I <laughs> just read. It's, uh, from the journal physiology and behavior. It's called, um, 
the, the title was Consumption of Cacao. <laughs> Flavanols results in an acute, which means uh, right away, they noticed it right away, acute improvement in visual and cognitive functions. So this was pretty cool. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, intermingle some, some cool behavioral and technical things you guys can do. And then I'm going to throw in some fun stuff like this. Like this basically took uh, two groups of people, prospective randomized trial, <laughs> and compared eating dark chocolate with white chocolate. <laughs> and they looked at, you know, if either of them improved their cognition and sort of uh, memory, and, and they challenged them with a couple of things. And their cognitive performance was increased with the cacao-containing chocolate, the dark chocolate, not with the white chocolate, <laughs> all other things being equal. And this was uh, 720 milligrams of cacao in their dark chocolate matched with white chocolate. And they even had them switch over, and those that did the white chocolate first got to do the dark chocolate second. And guess what? It wasn't um, based upon the individual. It, it had... Across the same people, it had a, a similar benefit. So it wasn't just that the one group that got the dark chocolate were smarter or could memorize things better. Like legit, it helped all the folks <laughs> when they had dark chocolate. So here you go, guys. You want to eat a little bit of dark chocolate? Like go for it. <laughs> Cacao, right? It's kind of cool, kind of fun. Can increase your memory. So I just wanted to throw that in there as kind of a fun study. Um, while we're doing fun studies, um, Another one that uh, I thought was pretty cool that I found um, looking at memory was about uh, my favorite fruit, really, <laughs> was about eating berries, <laughs> blueberries especially, blueberries um, and strawberries. In fact, this study looked at uh, folks who had increased. It was from the nurse's uh, health study, and they took a look at um, this uh, subset of people that tended to eat more uh, blueberries and um, uh, strawberries, and they found that their memory and brain health uh, and cognition was much better than those who didn't. So it was pretty cool. This was found in the uh, Annals of Neurology, 2012. I can put a link in the show notes. It says dietary intake of blueberries and flavonoids, which also are in strawberries, and this study looked at strawberries as well in relation to cognitive decline. And the results say greater intake of blueberries and strawberries were associated with slower rates of cognitive decline across all six cognitive tests for, um, for these folks. So, and this was a big study, the Nurses Health Study, I forget how many thousand, I think 16,000 plus participants. So it's pretty cool, pretty big study. So all of you folks that like blueberries and like strawberries keep liking them because <laughs> they're good for you <laughs> you know and blueberries have this other um thing in them besides just the antioxidant flavonoids they have resveratrol which is kind of that magic ingredient right in the uh um, folks that drink red wine that you know everybody talks about oh it's good to drink a little red wine it increases your brain health, your longevity, you know, decreases mTOR, you know, it helps with the sirtuins, you know, all these buzzwords that you guys have heard about lately. Well, all that can be achieved even without alcohol. If you're a non-drinker like me, you can access that same benefit from eating things like blueberries and grapes and those sort of brightly colored, deep, you know, red and purplish fruit, if you will. They can get you all these same benefits with the resveratrol then. Um, that the folks get that that drink uh, wine. So you don't have to drink wine is what I'm saying. If you want to have some, that's fine too. No judgment, definitely okay as long as you don't <laughs> drink too much, just in moderation, right? Um, because what we do know, actually, since we're talking about brain health and memory, that alcohol is actually toxic to your brain. So too much is not good. In fact, um, if you do several drinks, anything that might be associated with uh, binge drinking, which usually is classified at like between four and six drinks and onward, that will especially <laughs> especially decrease your ability to remember, not just in the short term, as is pretty dang obvious, but in the long term. So alcohol is actually toxic <laughs> to the brain. So you want to be a little bit careful. You don't want to drink too much, right? So be a little cautious with that. Um, but a little bit of uh, red wine um, is just fine. It has the res resveratrol in it and the flavonoids, the antioxidant uh, qualities. And that's all pretty fun stuff to learn about. Um, 
But just like the Goldilocks phenomenon, I like to say, right? <laughs> a little bit is good, but too much is no good. You got to have that sweet spot. <laughs> Another thing, while we're talking about sort of dietary stuff, one of my favorites as well with respect to both memory and brain health, and I've talked about this a little bit before in my podcast on brain health, but um, memory as well, and I, I tried to look up a bunch of different uh, research studies, and there are several, and I'm not going to bore you with them all, but having basically an increased um, quantity of the omega-3 fatty acids, eicosa pentanoic acid, that's EPA, and uh, DHA, which is docosa hexanoic acid. These omega-3s, which are found in fish, you know, the fish that's fatty, like mackerel, salmon, for me, tuna, which is the ahi that is my favorite in Hawaii, ne, getting getting that fresh seared ahi, you know, um, or, you know, a little bit of sushi or sashimi with that ahi. In fact, I just bought um, wild caught in, <laughs> it's probably one of those fresh frozen scenarios because I bought it on the mainland USA in the mountains at Costco, a big slab of what they say is fresh wild caught ahi or tuna. And actually we're having that tonight for dinner. We're having uh, ahi fish tacos. So, my wife is missing out, although she's not a big uh, fish uh, fanatic like I am. I just love, 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 love fish. So if you love it like I do, you know, things like mackerel, salmon, and tuna, or ahi, as we say in Hawaii, ne, that's going to get you some good omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, if you can't get the fish uh, well-sourced, you know, wild caught and all that stuff. It's just hard to get. Canned tuna ain't going to work, guys. It's got stuff you don't want in there like mercury and other crap. Most of that tuna is pretty pretty uh, below average. So you want to get fresh, wild caught, well-sourced, nothing that's farm-raised, none of that. Um, but if you can't do that, a supplement is fine that has uh, omega-3 fatty acids, like I said, the EPA, the eicosapentaenoic acid, and the DHA, the docosa hexanoic acid. These are awesome awesome not only for the brain they're awesome for your heart right they decrease inflammation they decrease stress they decrease anxiety they slow mental decline they're so helpful for brain health and they also improve your memory so pretty cool they've done a lot of studies on on supplementation with this and the sooner you start the better. What they found is that if you wait until you show cognitive decline or show dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, whatever, it doesn't work as good as if you take it proactively and prospectively and before you notice. So you know what I do besides eating all this yummy sushi, sashimi, ahi, tacos? I also take an omega-3 supplement as well because I just feel like it's so important for my mind, for my heart, and if you want to know more about what I take, you can email me at Modern Medicine Movement Podcast at Gmail or message me. We can talk more about that. But anyway, DHA and EPA, the fish oils, the omega 3s are awesome. So many benefits for the brain and the heart. Very anti inflammatory, just good, good stuff for you. And I'm not going to uh, belabor that because we've talked about it before. So that's an awesome, awesome supplement if you need one or just get it from your diet. I try to do that as much as possible. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to talk about, we'll kind of bounce around here just to liven it up so you guys don't go to sleep on me, um, is talk about behavioral stuff as well as supplement and dietary stuff because both of them are super important, right? Um, super, super important. When I talk about diet and brain health, there's lots of studies that show that too many refined carbohydrates or sugars are actually really bad <laughs> for the brain, right? Well, we know this. I mean, we've talked about this. They are pro-inflammatory. And neurodegenerative conditions of the brain are all inflammatory. Things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, they involve inflammation. So one of the goals to prevent them and to treat them is to decrease inflammation. And the best way to do that is with our diet. Do not eat inflammatory foods because remember, food is medicine. Food is medicine. So there's lots of studies that show that high um, sugar diets, especially sugary drinks, um, there's one that I'll throw into the show notes that talks about this. There's It's pretty interesting because when they talk about sugary drinks, they're also talking about fruit juices. And in my podcast with Ben Bickman, we talked about this. You know, he, his famous quote is, eat your fruit 
and don't drink your fruit. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, juices, I haven't bought a juice in years. I don't I don't drink any juices because they're so high in sugar, which has a super high glycemic index, which means that your sugar in their blood or your glucose jumps up right away, which then causes the insulin to also jump up. And then you have elevated insulin. And we've all learned that elevated insulin, when you have that too much, you get what's called insulin resistance, which is a very inflammatory condition at the root of almost all of the common health problems out there from heart disease to neurodegenerative diseases and even cancer. So we don't want to have our insulin up all the time. And one of the best ways to avoid that is avoiding the highly processed carbohydrates, especially sugars, especially sugars and especially sugary drinks. So I don't drink soda um, of any kind, really. Occasionally I do some carbonated water because I like carbonation, you know, Uh, maybe once a week or something like that, but I just do the type that just has fruit juice, um, like tiny bit, you know, like a drop of lemon in there or something, Uh, not the high, you know, basically uh, zero to very low calorie. I think it's maybe 10 calories, the stuff I get, Um, super low calories, but it just has a couple drops of fruit juice for flavor and it's carbonated water. And I do that, you know, once a week just for the carbonation that I like with certain, certain, uh, you know, meals that I have, uh, but very rare. I don't drink soda. I don't drink fruit juice. And the reason for that is I don't want my insulin up. (laughs) And there's a cool study just while we're talking about highly refined carbohydrates. I just found this study today. I was looking at, uh, um, you know, this brain health and memory stuff. And this came up in my search of PubMed, hopefully I can bring it up here, but it was a prospective study of folks who ate, quote unquote, ready to eat breakfast cereals. (laughs) And it was a pretty interesting study because um, they took, it was prospective. In other words, they didn't just go back and look at surveys that were already done. They took a group of people and prospectively over time, they um, got the data on whether or not they were eating these ready-to-eat breakfast cereals, you know, basically the stuff you just buy at the store that you just pour into a bowl and add milk or whatever, um, and those who didn't. And what they found, big surprise, let me just read it to you. <laughs> it is from the Journal of Nutrition, Health, and Aging. I'll put this in the show notes as well. Pretty cool, cool study. It says, prospective study of ready-to-eat breakfast cereal consumption and cognitive decline. <laughs> so this, this was done, um, I forget how many thousand people, around, around 4,000 uh, participants. And what they found, not surprisingly, was those that ate frequently more than once a week ready to eat <laughs> breakfast cereals had significantly more cognitive decline. We don't want that, right? Decline than those who did not. So ready to eat breakfast cereals with these highly refined carbohydrates, guess what? <laughs> Contrary to old Kellogg and CW Post, you know, that's the most important thing of the day. <laughs> breakfast cereals did not make the list. In fact, they increased your cognitive decline, which is not what you want. So really cool study I, I found today in my research for this podcast. I'll share it in the show notes. Uh, <laughs> but just thought that was interesting. I did a whole podcast on breakfast cereals. If you want to know the whole history behind them and all of the, <laughs> it's just crazy stuff. You just can't make this stuff up. So listen to that previous podcast on breakfast cereals, <laughs> but they're not good for you. But generally speaking, I haven't eaten a breakfast cereal in, geez, it's been, it's been a while, <laughs> years. But, but uh, anyway, um, let's bounce back. We've talked uh, about some, um, some dietary things because food is medicine. Let's bounce back to some behavioral things. Uh, one of the pearls that I want to leave you with today is what I like to call the three M's. And I don't know if I'm stealing this from somebody or I made it up somewhere. I I don't recall, but it's something that I've been working on for the last several years and I've sort of incorporated it into my behavior, into my routine. And I like to call it the three M's and they are for um, meditation, mindfulness, and mantra. So we'll talk about each of these uh, just for a moment. I mean, they could literally be a podcast for each in and of themselves, but they have all been shown to increase your memory. That's right, your memory and your brain health. So super cool stuff. Um, 
I think we all have a little bit of a sense of what they are. We're not going to delve into details, but but meditation um, is the first I'd like to talk about briefly, and it has been well studied in um, memory as well as cognition, um, brain health uh, studies, and has been shown, which I think is so fascinating, to increase the gray matter. Let me just say that again. Increase the gray matter of your brain, and neuronal cell bodies by um, meditation. So there's a study, um, I thought this was fascinating, um, because, you know, most of us would, I think, agree that meditation is good for you. You know, it gives you some space to kind of step away from what may be a chaotic time of day or a chaotic period in your life or just whatever it is. I mean, I got six kids running around. You know, I, I work, my wife works. We got all this different stuff going on. And it's just, it, it can be pretty chaotic. And if you take, you know, I, I do brief meditations. I don't do like an hour long med- meditation. Like I, I listen to podcasts on guys that do a daily, you know, hour long meditation. I'm like, how do you do that with six kids and all the other stuff that you're doing? Like, ah, sh- it's crazy. Like that would cut into my sleep and I'm trying to not cut into my sleep. <laughs> but, but even short periods of meditation can be really helpful. Um, this this uh, study I, I thought was super cool was from a neuroimaging journal in 2009. It says the anatomical correlate, correlates of long-term meditation, which are larger hippocampal, and frontal volumes of the gray matter. The gray matter is the stuff that you want, man. Lots of cool stuff. That's where the thinking occurs. The gray matter is where all the thinking goes on, basically. And then the white matter is, is basically the synapses and the connections and, and the communication between all those cells. But the gray matter is basically where you're doing all the thinking. It's sort of the top part of the brain, and it's where you do your thinking. The hippocampus is an area of the brain that's responsible for memory. So you want to get that muscle all flexed and active and grow it, well, meditation will help you. Meditation will help you. Also, the frontal lobes, um, which this study showed both larger frontal lobes and larger hippocampus uh, regions were directly related to meditation. So I thought that was super cool. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, the higher level thinking that we do, the so-called executive uh, function <laughs> of our brain is all in the frontal lobes, um, and the memory is in the hippocampus. So so it's not surprising that these would both be increased um, with meditation, which improves memory. So I thought that was super cool. Um, thought I would share that with you. So meditation, uh, we don't have time to go into you know how to do that. There's so many different types, and you know you pick what works for you. For me, I, I do simple short uh, meditations, like 15 to 20 minutes max. And I, I don't, uh, you know, like I said, do hour long meditations at this point in my life, but I'm hoping that maybe at one point, maybe I can <laughs> right now. It's just, uh, it just seems difficult to put into my schedule, but, uh, it's one of those things that I think is worth that time that it takes. And like I said, it doesn't have to be long meditations, but, uh, Improving your gray matter, that's pretty important because typically as we age, our gray matter shrinks and our whole brain volume, you know, our brains shrink with age unless we're doing a lot of stuff proactively. Um, it's just, that's just the way it is. You know, I look at uh, CT and MRI scans of folks all throughout their lives and it's pretty interesting when you have an MRI of a young kid. I mean, their brain is literally like at the brim of where the skull base is there's like no room in there it's like a big brain and it's perfectly matched to the skull there's like no empty space and then as you get to be my age there's a little bit of empty space as you get to be you know 60 70 80 90 there's a lot more empty space because our brains are shrinking well i personally don't want my brain to shrink and this is one of the ways that that can help you to prevent that and actually increase uh, the volume of your gray matter through meditation so i thought that was super cool um, in fact, they even did a study with some college students. Um, and this, this I thought was interesting because they basically did, um, a randomized control try to, uh, study in college students. And they had one group practice meditation and mindfulness, and they significantly did better <laughs> on these memory tasks than those that didn't. So, it, I mean, it was kind of like a real time comparison and I thought it was really cool, but anyway, Meditation, as we know, is so full of benefits, not just for your body to sort of have that 
space, that little bit of, uh, you know, gray space or whatever you want to call it to, that gives your you know body a moment to kind of step away from your busy life and have some connection and mindfulness and, and time to be able to rest your body and mind and allow for, you know, yourself to create and to have that thoughtful time. So meditation is not just good for your body. It's good for your mind, like duh, but it's also great for your memory. It's awesome. And these studies uh, show it. (laughs) And the second M is mindfulness, which kind of, it's not exactly the same as meditation because you can be mindful throughout the day and not necessarily chalking off, you know, a 15 minute time to be mindful. Like I would say, try to be mindful like as much as you can throughout the day. And this could be something as simple as when you're in a conversation with a friend or a loved one, just really being in the moment and connecting and listening and focusing deeply on what they're saying to you and not, you know, trying to just jump out with your response, but really just being engaged and listen to them. That's being mindful when you're in a conversation. Be mindful Outside, when you're going for your walk, look around you, look at your surroundings, look at the beauty, everything in this world in some way, you know, outside and in nature is beautiful, whether it be a desert landscape, you know, I love, love, love the deserts of Southern, you know, Utah and and Arizona, Northern Arizona and things. They're just so beautiful to me. I just think it's remarkable. Yet, I also love the lush greenery of Hawaii Ne, which is my home. And it's just I love the two stark comparisons. And if I'm outdoors, I just try to be mindful of that. And so practicing mindfulness, which we can do throughout the day, we don't have to, you know, separate a 15 or 30 minute period to do that. We can do that throughout the whole day, which is really cool. Um, The third M uh, is mantra. So meditation, mindfulness, and mantras. You guys all know what a mantra is. Generally speaking, it's a positive expression. So it's something like, I am enough. I am special. I am powerful. I am important. I can choose my destiny. I choose happiness. I love myself deeply and unconditionally. I have a grateful spirit and heart. I am enough. I am powerful. I am relentless. My life is rewarding. These are mantras. So these are cool, positive kind of affirmations that we can do on a daily basis. My wife is really awesome at this. She she puts a couple of things on the mirror and things that that are personal to her about her persona, her individuality, about her business, you know, how she wants to make positive change in the world. Like these little mantras, she'll put them on the bathroom mirror and she'll read them several times a day. And I'm just beginning to kind of incorporate this. I've always had a couple of mantras that I remember that I say in my mind, but I'm not quite to the level she is and putting them on the bathroom mirror. But these are cool things too, because these positive affirmations will also help you with your brain health, believe it or not. Positivity is not only important for every other part of your health, but obviously for your brain health, your mental health, and your ability to you know remember things. Like if you tell yourself, I can remember things, I am great at remembering people's names and faces. And then you there's there's some mechanical things you can do too, some associations and other kind of hacks, if you will, to help remember things. And I don't even have time to get into all those fun, fun things. You know, stimulate your senses when you're learning something new, right? Make it visual, make it audible, you know. Also, use your hand and write it down. There's so many different ways. The more senses that you can use when you're learning new content, it's more likely that you'll remember it. And there's lots of people out there that are expert in this. I think one that I've heard a couple of times on different podcasts is I think his name is Jim Quick, but he's pretty amazing. He's written a few books and he he can teach you all this mechanical stuff about remembering things. And it's, it's fascinating. But at the base and the root of it is a positive mantra. You have to be positive about yourself, about your ability. You are powerful. You are enough. You are special. So a mantra is really, really important. And I, 
you know, we're getting, getting down to the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the podcast. So we're going to run through a couple other things just briefly, just to refresh our memory as to the importance of them. But I really wanted to give you those three M's because they've been so important in my life, meditation, mindfulness, and the positive mantras. Okay. Another thing I talked about in my last week's podcast was sleep. Believe it or not, sleep is where we establish our memories for the long term. When we learn new stuff, new content, new you know abilities, whatever it is, those memories get solidified in our hippocampus while we are sleeping. So guess what? Another benefit that I didn't even talk about last week or the other two podcasts I did before that on sleep. I think I may have. In my earliest one, I talked about the hippocampus and I talked about memory. And basically, we establish these memories in our brains at night while we sleep. So getting appropriate, you know, our seven to eight or nine hours of sleep, oh my gosh. Not only is it restful and important for the housekeeping of our bodies, we need time for our guts to rest, our brains to rest, to flush out all the toxins, do that sort of housekeeping, if you will, the autophagy that many like to talk about um, that occurs at night mostly while we're sleeping. We also need this to establish memories. And if you want to know the details about that, I talked about it a little bit more in my previous podcast. I believe it was on circadian rhythm or on sleep, um, how the memories are established. But we need to have good quality and adequate. For me, I used to have quality sleep, but it wasn't adequate. It's like four or six hours max. And now I'm really focusing on getting my seven or eight hours. And it's been marvelous. <laughs> Just ask my wife. I'm not grumpy anymore. <laughs> Anyway, there's also studies that that have compared groups of people learning new content and those that had good sleep retained that content better. So sleep is super important with establishing new memories. Um, Brain training, uh, we kind of talked about that with skills and things, dietary stuff. We talked about cutting back on the sugars, refined carbs. Another cool thing I've talked about before, but it's another benefit. It's one of my favorite vitamins once again. In fact, I was looking out the window just before this podcast thinking about there might be a little bit more vitamin D available (laughs) out there. It was a bluebird day, sunny weather. Vitamin D also, among so many other things, helps with your memory. In fact, in a study done on 318 older adults for five years, they found that those who had blood levels of vitamin D that was on the low side, they had more memory and cognitive uh, decline than those who had normal vitamin D levels. And they said normal was at least above 20. I would, I would humbly say that you should really try to get your vitamin D level at least above 30 or 40 um, because all of the other benefits, immune health benefits, aging, or I should say anti-aging and anti-cancer benefits come when your levels are higher than the 20 sort of bare minimum level, you know, when they get up to between 35, 40, 45, 50, 60, these levels are really, really awesome to give you all those additional benefits like the immunologic, you know, benefit. In other words, that you'll be able to avoid illness, you know, in fact, COVID has been shown to be less severe when you have um, elevated vitamin D levels to the normal or the higher range. You're less likely to get a bad COVID infection. You're less likely just to get sick at all. And you're going to, I mean, you're going to be so much more healthy in general if your vitamin D level is up. It helps with mood. It helps with brain health. It helps with longevity. It decreases your likelihood of getting cancer. Even if you have cancer, it will help decrease um, the ability of the cancer to uh, promote itself and continue to grow. It actually, even if you have cancer, increasing your vitamin D will decrease the proliferation of that cancer. So vitamin D is awesome. <laughs> As you guys know, I always talk about vitamin D from the sun primarily, but I also do supplement. In fact, right now <laughs> I'm in a place that doesn't get as much sunshine. Um, I'm in the mountains and it's, the days are shorter. And so I'm taking vitamin D supplementation myself. <laughs> but vitamin D is awesome, once again, for so many things. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the benefits of exercise with respect to memory, with respect to brain health. Exercise is so important for our health and also our brains, our memory. In fact, there was um, a study done of about 150 people which showed that just one 15-minute moderate exercise on a bike led to improved memory and cognitive performance. 
um, across all age groups. It didn't matter. They even had a subject in that group that was 93 years old. And guess what? The exercise helped that person too. Like exercise helps us from literally the moment we are born till the moment we die. It's so, so important for our minds, our bodies, our souls, our spirits, and our memory. So exercise, 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 you know, jump in on the six for six movement with my wife, which is exercising six days a week because it's so helpful. It increases our brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, among so many other things and has such benefits for your brain, your heart, your soul, your mental health, brain health, memory, cognition. So, so important. Oh, and then let, let's just round it off with a couple kind of more of these supplement kind of food stuff, kind of fun things that are cool as well. Um, as I've mentioned many times before, choosing an anti-inflammatory diet is so important. So important. Anti-inflammatory foods, which are primarily whole foods, uh, whole fruits, whole vegetables, not the juice, but the whole foods, um, especially those that have antioxidants in them, will lower our oxidative stress. They will mop up those free radicals. They can be found in fruits and vegetables. If you like tea, green tea has been shown to be marvelous at this. Uh, lots of benefits there if you like green tea. Um, you know, just, just eating more fruits and vegetables has been shown. Uh, in one particular study I read uh, this weekend, uh, it was over 30-something thousand people. It basically stated that those who ate more fresh fruits and vegetables had much lower risks of cognitive decline lower risk of cognitive decline and dementia compared to those who maybe were eating the other stuff, you know, the highly processed breakfast cereals that we talked about or whatever. And this is primarily because fresh fruits and vegetables have increased amounts of um, antioxidants, basically, right? The flavonoids, the anthocyanins, and they are awesome at cognition and also to prevent Memory loss. <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh. Another, another thing that I actually do supplement with is uh, uh, turmeric. And I, I do it mostly for an anti-inflammatory effect. I, I'm a super active guy. Like I mentioned, I just started skiing. <laughs> you know, my 47th year of life, I started skiing for the first time. And I take turmeric every um, day, really, to help me with the anti uh, inflammatory um, portion of it, but also it's been shown uh, to be a potent, not only anti-inflammatory, but a potent antioxidant. So this is from the turmeric uh, root. Um, you can con consider supplementing with that. There's a study that showed um, how this reduces the oxidative damage and inflammation in the brain. And it also lowered this uh, thing that we all want to try to avoid, which is the amyloid plaques, right? These are what accumulates and dementias, right? And things like uh, the most common form of dementia out there, which is Alzheimer's. And I just read that dementia is now the third leading uh, health uh, expenditure uh, category. So we have heart disease, diabetes, and its associated conditions. And this, which, which is dementia, and, and oftentimes people are referring to this as type 3 diabetes because it is in that spectrum, that inflammatory spectrum. It is unfortunately way too common, and um, you know we talked about how we can reduce this with anti-inflammatory foods, with decreased sugars, especially the processed ones, and then um, turmeric can help with this as well, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. We talked about cacao, which was really fun. <laughs> talked about our strawberries and raspberries. Oh, I love those so much. Oh, my gosh. Uh, talked about drinking less alcohol, right? A little bit with uh, red wine is okay. We talked about my three M's, the, my favorites, mindfulness, meditation, and positive mantras. We talked about uh, sleep. Oh, my gosh. We talked about so many things this podcast, fish oils or the omega-3s um, that are so important, right? Those were so cool. We talked about eating them or supplementing with them that have EPA and DHA. Uh, the very, very last thing is just overall maintaining a healthy weight. That's actually been shown to, to help with not only decreasing your risk for cognitive decline, um, but it's also been shown to help with your memory, right? So achieving your ideal weight uh, basically is going to help you to have less inflammation because we know if we have too many fat cells, those fat cells basically, um, <laughs> they primarily, right, there's a couple of hormones that they have a lot of in, involvement with. One is insulin. 
Um, one is leptin, and both of them with too much adiposity or too many or too big of fat cells, they both go up and our inflammation levels go way up. And we've learned that inflammation ain't good, not good for the heart, and it's not good for the brain. So being a healthy weight, super, super important. They found just looking at weight and body mass indices that people with elevated levels of weight and BMI or body mass indices had, guess what? Worse performance on basically memory tests and higher risks of developing dementia like Alzheimer's and uh, all those other dementias out there. So it's a risk factor. We don't want to be overweight or obese because it will enhance our risk for neurodegenerative illnesses, for cognitive decline, for worsened memory, all these things. And we can change this. That's the cool thing. And we can change it actually pretty easily, quickly, and readily. And we all can do this. It is possible. It's not through a fad diet. It's through healthy living of real, whole foods that are unprocessed, not full of refined carbs that are, in fact, low in carbs for the most part, eating healthy fats, no seed oils, you know, eating our raspberries or blueberries, whatever it is, our anti-inflammatory diet with fresh food, real whole food and maintaining a healthy weight for us will help our brains and help our memory. So, oh my gosh, guys, we've talked about so many cool things today. I've really enjoyed this. I hope you have too. I hope you'll share it. If you found any value here, gosh, we've talked about maybe 15 different things that we can do to improve our memory, improve our minds, improve our brain health. Oh, so much good stuff here. I hope you'll share it with those you care about, with your friends, your family. You know, feel free to tag me, write me a review, drop it on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and jump into my free group, Modern Medicine Movement Health and Wellness Group. Reach out to me there. Reach out to me. Uh, by email, I'm still old school like that, modernmedicinemovement at gmail.com, at Aloha Surf Doc, my Instagram, or even at Modern Medicine Movement on Instagram. Check me out there, uh, join my group, and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any content. And please feel free to share. I love, love, love sharing. And uh, yeah, you can shoot me a comment and even a question or stuff you want to learn more about. I tried to you know, do podcasts that you guys are interested in and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you guys. Oh, I just wish you the best of this magical, marvelous, beautiful time of year for you and yours. A big happy holidays and a big, uh, low.